One last thing, Chelsea. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Ali Senator. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist. I am based in the ShopRite of Hoboken. Does anybody shop at ShopRite of Hoboken? Awesome. Thanks for joining. So I've done a few presentations uh, before about breakfast, healthy eating for the holidays, lots of other topics. This is uh, one that's kind of near and dear to me. I love talking about anti-inflammatory foods. Uh, because it kind of allows us to encompass um, a lot of what I teach about label reading and understanding the functionality of our foods. Um, so I'll get started and I will go over foods that may contribute to inflammation and then foods which may help um, inflama inflammatory conditions and then talk a little bit about what I do at ShopRite. So what is inflammation? Inflammation is your body's process of fighting against things that may harm it, like an infection or an injury or toxins in an attempt to heal itself. So chronic inflammation can be difficult to recognize. Factors like obesity, smoking cigarettes, and eating certain foods may uh, make you more susceptible to reacting as if something is abnormal or foreign, triggering an inflammatory response in your tissues and your organs. So some conditions where we see inflammation or oxidative stress, rheumatoid arthritis, colitis, psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, um, a lot of uh, gastrointestinal disorders can have, uh, can carry with them a lot of inflammation, asthma, lupus, uh, esophagitis, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, celiac, Crohn's, and metabolic syndrome or diabetes. <laughs> So there's um, different types of inflammation. Um, it's a normal response of your immune system, um, but there's increasing evidence that chronic inflammation is a player in many diseases. So acute inflammation would be your tonsillitis, joint pain, bowel inflammation, um, potentially related to diverticulitis or diverticulosis, um, body pains, and then chronic inflammation would be arthritis, atherosclerosis, bowel diseases, joint and skin diseases. It's also um, a potential indicator of future issues such as cancer and other diseases. So I'm going to go into foods which may contribute to inflammation in the body. First up, we're gonna talk a little bit about saturated fats and sodium. So um, ultra processed foods can change your gut microbiota and lead to inflammation. I mentioned earlier as we were walking in, the gut is kind of like the window um, to your health. We're learning a lot about gastrointestinal health in the past several years. There's a lot of research um, about uh, the, effects, the, effect, the effectiveness of probiotics to heal uh, skin health. Um, in probiotics to improve brain function. Many processed foods when eaten very frequently can wreak havoc on our gut. So we're going to talk more about supporting our gut health um, later on, but to put it simply, fat takes the longest to digest. And when a food is ultra processed, um, it kind of slows down our rate of digestion and we're not able to get um, the most out of our food. So foods that are high in saturated fats would be your heavily marbled steaks, red meats, pork, um, coconut oil is actually pure saturated fat. So a lot of people believe um, coconut oil is a healthy oil, but it should be limited just as you limit butter. Um, sausages and processed meats, um, bacon, 
bacon actually ironically has 40% less fat than butter. So when rendered properly, it can be included. Not saying to eat bacon every single day, every meal, but um, just something to think about um, when we consider how often we're having these types of foods, how we're cooking them um, and how much. Uh, and then also red palm oil. So we don't typically spread red palm oil on toast, but we will see it snuck into a lot of processed foods such as pastries, cakes, um, and cookies, you will be able to notice if there are any of these saturated fats in your um, food product that you're buying, such as like cookies and crackers, by looking at the saturated fat on the label. Um, we typically want to look for less than four grams on a label. Um, but typically, I will look at the ingredients. Um, you know, I'm not going to put a product down just because it has uh, red palm oil or um, saturated fat. Um, but I will look at the amount and how much I'm going to consume of that product. Um, other foods that can contain um, inflammatory, um, other potentially inflammatory foods which can contain a lot of sodium and fat are, are uh, commercial and processed foods. So donuts, ready-made biscuits, um, cakes and pies, coffee creamer does have saturated fat. Another thing to consider, I mentioned before, how much are we using? So uh, a serving of coffee creamer might be one gram, but is it one gram per tablespoon? How many tablespoons are we using? Um, so we'll get into more detail about saturated fat now. So there have been several studies uh, that demonstrate the potential health benefits for substituting saturated fat with unsaturated fat, particularly oleic acid and omega-3s. Um, I, I just did a brain health and heart health presentation and I have a million slides about the benefits of including omega-3s in your diet, which we can kind of dip into later preferred. Um, reducing consumption of foods that are rich in saturated fats. So your meat products, animal products, um, just choosing leaner, um, choosing reduced fat cheeses, choosing lower fat options um, can uh, have some beneficial effects and potentially reduce the incidence of metabolic disease. Saturated fatty acids come from animal products. Like I mentioned, the coconut and the palm oil are the exceptions um, and can potentially induce inflammatory responses in the body in excess. Overconsumption of fatty acids, a high fat diet contributes to weight gain and inflammation, particularly when we have a high LDL or a bad cholesterol, our central adiposity, so our belly weight can go up. Um, so that can increase our risk for clogged arteries, heart disease risk, and even stroke. So there's different types of fat in the body. There's white fat and then there's brown fat. So uh, brown fat is energy burning. Uh, we're, we're born with this. Um, and you actually, there's a true or false here. This always surprises everyone. True or false, you have the same amount of fat in your body, fat cells, that you did when you were an adolescent. What do we think? True. True. So actually, these are, imagine the yellow is our, our fat cells. We are essentially just having our fat cells expand over time as we, sorry, as we gain weight. That's a little fun fact I learned. Yes, same amount, but different, different it's filled up a little bit like a, like a water balloon essentially. And uh, high LDL can increase the potential of that happening. So saturated fats, the general recommendation is to limit to 10% of total calories. So what does that look like? So for somebody on a 2000 calorie diet, that would be less than 22 grams, uh, but the American Heart Association recommends less than 13 grams. So assuming that an animal, like a serving of an animal product like chicken breast might have like two grams, an egg might have two grams, something to think about throughout the day. Um, if you're having something that might be heavy in saturated fat, to kind of maybe eat vegetarian for the rest of the day, kind of limit um, the amount of other saturated fats you're having. So the increase would happen on the molecular level, correct? Increase of fat? Yes. yes. So 
slide. So next, I get this question probably once a week at ShopRite. Um, hydrogenated oils, are they inflammatory? Are they bad for me? Um, so they are oils made when hydrogen is added to liquid fats to make them solid. So an example would be your margarine or your Crisco. Some, I will say some products um, are labeled and marketed as plant butter. One of them in particular says, uh, like just to give an example, made with avocado oil. It's not made of avocado oil. So the first ingredient in some of these products will be palm oil. So when you look at the saturated fat and you hold a butter and a plant butter side by side, the saturated fat is very, very similar. So um, these are used to improve, improve taste and texture, to cut costs, preserve shelf life of food products. So not only will you find them in the dairy section, you will also find them uh, in different food products. Um, trans fats, also known as partially hydrogenated oils, uh, were deemed safe in 2015 by the FDA and phased out of the food supply. Um, trans fats still exist naturally in animal foods like goat, cow, sheep, and lamb. Trans fats can contribute to insulin resistance. If you have anything in your cabinets from before 2015, <laughs> may or may not have trans fats in it. Um, the FDA released certification that states that the fully hydrogenated rapeseed oils are safe for sparing use in food products, though they may be safe, it doesn't mean they're healthy to have all the time and in excess. So what I talk about is the importance of our ratio of our polyunsaturated fats, like our, um, our typical like frying oils and our omega-3s. In this country, in a Western diet, we have a very high consumption of polyunsaturated, which are healthy fats, but we're not getting enough omega-3s. So kind of bringing that omega-3 up um, I have uh, other presentations where I talk about exactly like how much we should shoot for. Um, I believe it's a three to one or four to one ratio of omega threes, uh, omega three fatty acids to polyunsaturated fats like your corn oil. But just including something like avocado or um, an omega three like flaxseed bread, um, or even omega three fortified um, eggs or extra leafy greens can kind of help you get there. Um, another way to reduce intake of saturated, uh, I'm sorry, hydrogenated oils is to eat less processed foods, eating more whole foods like fruits, veggies, grains, nuts, legumes, and lean proteins. Um, from a whole diet perspective, I never tell anybody they can't have a food ever again. It's just how much, how are we having it? You know, if we're having a lot of fried foods, we're going to be synonymously ingesting a lot of oil. So something to consider. <clears throat> so I have a label comparison here. I believe this is bowl and basket. Um, oops, sorry. So I have GIF where I'm looking at the label um, and it says it's got um, mono, uh, what is it? Sorry, uh, partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. Um, saturated fat might be like a gram or two or a half a gram higher because it's got that to kind of stretch the peanut butter. Um, but when you're looking at, you know, a label for a peanut butter that I would look for, um, you know, there's really no need to add additional oils. There's oils in peanut butter. It naturally has saturated fat. So a typical, you know, just peanuts and salt peanut butter is what I would look for. Minimal ingredients, minimal chance that you're going to have any extra added saturated fats in that peanut butter or other nut butter. Um, we also see um, these oils in processed dinners, baked goods, frostings, microwave popcorn, pastries, anything that you could suspect would have like a type of margarine in it. Um, and if, if all else has failed and if you are looking to kind of reduce uh, the amounts of potentially inflammatory foods in your diet, then you can kind of like look in all your products and say, okay, maybe I'm gonna choose the one with less ingredients um, and see what I get to. Um, so it's not necessary to eliminate all of these foods. However, just considering again, how often we're including them and what types we're including. Next, I'm gonna talk about sodium. So a high sodium intake has been associated with inflammation in patients with high blood pressure, um, and atherosclerosis in observational studies and a lower sodium 
diet is associated with reduced mortality, reduced heart disease, and reduced stroke. One small human study has documented increased indicators of inflammation on a high sodium diet. Um, so we might uh, wanna consider that high salt intake could increase our risk for dehydration. We want to make sure that when we're having a meal, we're always having water or having another hydrating beverage with it. High sodium intake can increase your blood pressure um, and increase oxidative stress or inflammation, um, increase your risk for stroke, um, and calcium depletion as well, and potential bone density changes. So Americans consume around 3,400 milligrams a day. On a Western diet, it's very easy to get to that amount. <laughs> you could do that with a few slices of pizza. Uh, but the American uh, dietary guidelines recommend less than 2,300 milligrams. The way that I recommend most of my patients and clients to go about this, around less than 600 for meals, around less than 200 for snacks. That way you know, when you add it all up, you're like still under 2000. So even if you were a little bit over, you're kind of staying within range. The American Heart Association recommends less than 1500 milligrams, which can be difficult for somebody that eats a lot of processed food. So what I typically recommend is kind of like weaning yourself off, trying uh, products that are a little bit lower, um, not making a full change overnight the most sustainable changes are the ones that we slowly kind of incorporate. <clears throat> Another thing that can contribute um, to potential inflammation is excess refined carbohydrates. Um, I don't say just refined carbohydrates, it's excess. So a carbohydrate that is refined is one without fiber. Um, it breaks down more easily into sugar, which is our body's preferred source of energy but the fiber is very important um, for our heart health, for our digestion, and for how we uh, control our blood sugar. Sources of excess refined carbohydrates, that would be your soda, white bread, white rice, regular pasta. These foods can still fit into a healthy diet, but something that I teach at my, at my store is portioning, understanding what to have these foods with to make them more satiating, um, and how to make sure that you're not having naked carbs most of the time that you're having fiber with them. And you can do that even if you're not a whole wheat pasta person you can do that by adding certain vegetables. Um, so adding a fiber source such as beans, hemp seeds, nuts um, to prevent blood sugar imbalance. Uh, the general recommendation is to choose whole grain products 50% of the time or more. So a whole grain product is going to have the bran, it's going to have the germ or the, uh, the minerals, sorry, it's a little blurry, uh, the antioxidants, including vitamin E, B vitamins and healthy fats are located. Um, and this would be like your white rice. This is the endosperm, this is in the whole grain. But when you're buying um, like just typical white rice or pasta that's um, you know just traditional pasta, it's gonna be stripped of some of those nutrients. And we want those, they keep us full, they help our blood sugar get regulated. Um, and highly refined carbohydrate consumption can adversely impact our good cholesterol or our HDL. Um, and when our HDL is lower, our risk for um, heart disease is higher. <laughs> Excess alcohol is another potential um, indicator that uh, for risk of uh, non, sorry, <laughs> for risk of inflammation, uh, non-drinkers and heavy drinkers, when studied, um, had higher C-reactive protein concentration. So in the hospital, nursing home, wherever, um, part of what I do is lab work, assessment, evaluation, um, for as related to nutrition. So CRP indicates like our level of inflammation in the body. There's also other um, labs that you can do that can tell you if you have inflammation like your urine. Um, but this one found, that, this study found that there's a strong association between markers of inflammation, especially CRP and risk for coronary heart disease. Um, so typically low to moderate consumption of alcohol is actually associated with lower cardiovascular mortality. So thinking of the Mediterranean diet, glass of wine a day, it's actually, it's actually part of the dietary recommendations. Um, there is something to that. Um, so drinking in moderation. So the recommendation is one drink or less a day for women. You know, you get the, um, you get the benefit of red wine um, when, you, um, when you ingest red wine as opposed to, you know, 
liquor or beer. Um, and then two drinks a day or less for men. Yes. So being a doctor, it's actually less healthy than being a baby. According to this study. <laughs> Um, I linked the study here. So generally, um, it has to do with like antioxidants. Um, so you could, if you were a non-drinker, just include more antioxidants to get that same benefit, um, like berries um, and other types of um, foods like that. We're going to go into the anti-inflammatory foods now. Uh, another top question that I get, is dairy good for me? Yes, it is. Um, it can have saturated fat in it because it is from an animal product. However, when we're choosing lower fat, not a problem. Um, also, um, it has anti-inflammatory properties because it has, um, when it's cultured, it has probiotics, which is benefit to our gut health. Um, so again, we're looking for lower fat products to reduce the saturated fat. Some fat is still necessary um, to absorb vitamins A and D. So if I have a client that um, doesn't like any other sources of vitamin A and D, but they do drink milk, I'm not gonna recommend that they, that they go um, skim. They, and if they're not having fat at that meal, they're not gonna absorb those vitamins. Certain vitamins are soluble with water, like B and C. Certain, voluble, certain vitamins are soluble with fat, like A, B, E, and K. So it's kind of, it's nuanced um, how I make these recommendations. Um, so supporting the gut health can help reduce inflammation. Kefir and yogurt, Greek has more protein um, and probiotic beverages. I have bought some today for you to try if you'd like. Um, and then I have a 2019 review um, on here that found similar results reporting that consumption of milk and dairy um, products is not linked to inflammation because there's this big, uh, myth that dairy causes inflammation. It's really the saturated fat that's in dairy in excess that can cause inflammation. Um, but we want to consider as a whole, it's a great source of protein, vitamins, minerals. Um, so including the types of dairy that are cultured is definitely beneficial. So there are other sources of probiotics, uh, studies on humans and animals show that probiotics can have a pivotal effect on our immune function and inflammatory mechanisms. In this study, they tested urine metabolites and measured inflammatory markers. And there were much lower inflammation markers in those with, AD, with IBS who improved their probiotic intake. So if they had probiotics daily, they were having uh, less symptoms. Um, reduction in inflammation from probiotics has been shown time and time again to improve symptoms. For skin inflammation, rheumatoid arthritis, and other inflammatory conditions, joint conditions as well. Several findings on human and animal models have studied, uh, have demonstrated the importance of the microbiota and host interaction in celiac disease and um, in ulcerative colitis. So those back again with those um, gastrointestinal disorders and potential for inflammation. Probiotics can improve the IBS symptoms um, overall and reduce gut inflammation. So um, these are all products that we carry at ShopRite, um, Cleveland Kraut. Only thing here, you just wanna consider the sodium and the portion, um, even just adding a little bit to a meal can give you the pro probiotic benefit. Um, for my clients that are not very into yogurt, I usually recommend Chobani probiotic or um, a kimchi or a kombucha. Chobani probiotic is a oat fermented beverage it's very good. Um, you don't have to drink the whole thing to get the benefit. Um, there's, as with yogurt, there's millions of active life bacteria in there, good bacteria. Um, then there's kombucha, which is kind of a little bit more acidic. Um, I have a lot of soda drinkers that happen to really like kombucha. I can't get to that point. <laughs> I'm not a kombucha lover, uh, but I do love like traditional Korean kimchi. So that's where I get my um, probiotics from and yogurt. Um, so these are all great um, options to add. And does it have to be uh, like sugar? Yeah, so the the Chobanis are, I think, 15 grams of carbohydrate. Okay. So that's actually, it's considered one serving of carbohydrate. 
Um, when I look for beverages, I like to look for 15 or lower. Zero if, you know, if possible, but um, if I'm considering that I'm, and you don't have to drink the whole thing. If I'm considering that like I'm replacing this to get the benefit of a yogurt, a yogurt typically is 15 grams of carbs, like a, a good one. Um, so similar. Yogurt, it's, uh, I heard a few times people say that sugar consumption is, is uh, Excess, right. You find a lot of money with yogurt that have like percent right. 12 percent yeah. sugar content. So it's kind of like so the, mo the most important thing that I like uh, to stress with the label, always look at total carbohydrate. The total carbohydrate is the sugar. Um, and then if you get more into it, um, you know, underneath the uh, label, it'll always say like how much dietary fiber. So it's, it's part of the carbohydrate, but it's not part that raises it. So you always take your carbs and you subtract your fiber. That's how much sugar is really in it. Um, I, I usually tell them that you just don't look at sugar. <laughs> I mean, like if you're concerned about added sugars, your body processes all sugars the same way, essentially. It's just how much. Um, but total carbs is actually where you're going to find the sugar. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming that more sodium or salt is usually promoted for manufacturing more salt or more Makes it taste really good, so we come back and buy it. <laughs> um, it could be texture, also. So um, sugar can in bake. I went to culinary school, so I had to take all these courses. It can affect um, our tenderness of baking. Um, it can affect our, our browning and certain baked goods. Um, it's a lot of different reasons, but. Typically in food processing, the sugar and the sodium tend to go up. Um, but um, part of my role is trying to help select those products that are a little bit lower and not too much more expensive uh, or even cheaper um, that don't have that to worry about. Does the sugar ever preserve? I'm not quite sure. I can get back to you on that. Uh, next up, whole grains. So a diet rich in whole grains can reduce your disease risk. Uh, whole grains contain fiber, we mentioned before, vitamins, minerals that can reduce inflammatory markers like our CRP. And also it's been studied, our TNF factor, so our tumor necrosis factor. It's um, basically a component that plays a role in cancer growth. Um, so studies have found that eating just 100 grams or three to four ounces of whole grains a day can reduce overall inflammation in the body, just half a cup. You should have um, six servings a day of whole grains, but it just goes to show just that little bit, just adding that little bit in can have a really big effect. Um, so the way that you get six servings in a day, um, essentially um, so you can do like a cup of brown rice, that's three, um, two slices of bread and some whole grain crackers, done. Uh, some examples of what's recommended. Um, so the dietary guidelines recommend at least three to five, six to 10 is optimal for health. You can work them into your snacks with like crackers, um, whole grain waffles with protein um, and whole grains help keep us fuller longer because of the fiber. It helps also to regulate our blood sugar. Some examples, um, I listed some of my favorites Farro, um, it's kind of like the whole wheat grain. If, if you like barley, you'll love farro. Um, bulgur, it's like a cracked wheat. Whole wheat pasta or couscous. Um, I really like the Barilla Protein Plus. It's kind of like a hybrid of chickpea pasta and regular pasta. It's got a lot of vitamins, big fan, a lot of fiber too. And it doesn't have that like whole wheat taste. I don't know, I, I, I switch between whole wheat, I switch between the protein pasta um because i like to try everything but uh that's one that i've tried um we also have a great bob's red mill aisle where we have other grains like amaranth um whole wheat bread um it doesn't have to be dave's killer bread even though i really like dave's killer bread um pepperidge farm makes a very inexpensive whole wheat bread um and also you can do like something quick like 100 percent whole wheat like brown rice pasta like a vermicelli um, oats, regular brown rice, or even popcorn is actually considered a whole grain. And then our monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fats. Um, so 
our polyunsaturated fats are our corn oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, seeds, or cold water fish. Uh, monounsaturated are our uh, olive oil, canola, peanut, sesame, avocado, most nuts. So our olive oil, our avocado, and our nuts, uh, especially, specifically walnuts, are rich in omega-3s. Replacing um, dietary saturated fat with mono or poly can significantly lower your total cholesterol and your bad LDL levels, including just like avocado and nuts and fatty fish a few times per week um, can help you get there. Um, selecting one of these heart healthy cooking oils for daily use is recommended. So like an avocado oil or olive oil. And then can't forget about omega-3s. Omega-3 fatty acids can inhibit an enzyme in your body that produces the prostaglandin hormone, which can spark inflammation. So that's why there's a lot of buzz about omega-3s. Found in salmon, walnuts, mackerel, flaxseed oil, chia seeds, and now um, tofu that I saw today. Uh, we have fortified with omega-3. Chicken eggs are now fortified with omega-3. Um, Mountainside Farms is one, and then Eggland's Best also. Um, and then leafy greens is often forgotten, but also a good source of omega-3s. And then of course, our fruits and vegetables. Can't do a presentation without talking about them. Um, focusing on fresh or frozen produce most of the time, um, but you can um, you know, utilize canned um, items in your cooking or your uh, meal preparation, um, rinsing canned veg and looking for lower sodium. So under 150 milligrams is considered low sodium on a nutrition box label. Um, so veggies and fruits are rich in flavonoids and antioxidants associated with a lower risk of stroke, coronary heart disease and markers of inflammation and oxidative stress in adults. The more variety you include, the different nutrients that you're getting from it. You're still getting carbohydrates, you're still getting some fiber, um, but different uh, micronutrients like our vitamins and our minerals. Good sources of the fiber. So our beans, legumes, broccoli, berries, pears, apples, avocado, bananas, you name it. Um, there's a million different ways we can enjoy them. Um, I always tell kids and adults, you have to try something 13 times before you get a taste for it. It's a real thing. Uh, but, you know, trying it in different ways, trying roasting, trying pureeing it. Um, if you're not a fan of it, you know, try it in a different cooking preparation. Um, I mentioned canned can be beneficial also. Rinse to reduce the sodium. I don't recall the exact percentage, but you can bring down the sodium significantly just by rinsing um, your canned veg in a strainer. And frozen is actually the most nutritious uh, because they are picked at the peak of ripeness. They're picked when their nutrition is optimal. Um, and I always say the best vegetables are the ones that you're going to eat. If you are trying to include more veggies in your diet, consider something like the slaw here. This is something I always have. Um, it's literally just shredded broccoli, shredded carrots, shredded kale, throw it on tacos, uh, saute it, put fish on it. I, I try to put things in my house that I'm actually going to easily be able to prepare. Um, a lot of people come to the store and they want to do a big shopping trip, uh, buy a bunch of groceries, and then realize they have to prepare them all. Um, we try to make it easy. Um, so there are a lot of quick um, options, both frozen and fresh, um, that kind of help you cut the time down on your prep to include these vegetables and fruits more often. And another one is coffee and tea. So green tea leaves um, are rich in flavonoids and polyphenols. Um, neuroprotective and antioxidant effects similar to our red wine. Um, antioxidants can combat oxidative stress and inflammation. There's moderate evidence for health benefits of black tea, specifically on colorectal cancer risk. Coffee shows some promise against anti-inflammatory uh, response. Um, it continues to be studied. The dietary information from three large well-known heart disease studies suggests that drinking one to two cups of caffeinated coffee uh, may reduce your heart failure risk. So I have mine under here. Um, so uh, I have a little uh, infographic for how much coffee, for how much caffeine is actually in your beverages. Um, typically teas tend to be a little bit less, so around 45 milligrams, sometimes up to 60. Um, 
and then our coffee is anywhere from like 80, 90. Um, it's actually higher if it's brewed and less if it's instant. Yes, um, I'm not sure how much does it say Red Bull has. Very similar. I'd say not that huge of a difference, but it also depends on uh, the potency of the coffee and how much you're drinking. Are you just drinking one cup? Are you drinking three? Um, Um, and then second to last, we're going to talk about dark chocolate, the benefits of dark chocolate. So 70% dark or up is what we're aiming for. Do I, do I recommend switching to all your, uh, switching all your chocolate chips to hundred percent dark? Absolutely not. One of my customers did that, not recommended, <laughs> but, um, you know, kind of working it in, into snacks, um, choosing the bars that are 70% or greater having it, you know, mixed with something like peanut butter and using it as a dip um, for apples is, is one thing uh, you can do to include it. Regular intake of dark cocoa powder and dark chocolate can be protective for heart and brain health. It has polyphenols, again, that can help reduce your blood pressure. Dark chocolate has been found to reduce LDL cholesterol. So again, back to the LDL cholesterol. Um, studies have shown that including cocoa can improve your cognition and it contains flavanols and a specific compound called theobromine, which has anti-inflammatory properties. This has been very widely studied. There's a million articles on theobromine. Um, and then effects on reducing inflammation were more potent in women, specifically um, vascular inflammation. Um, so I would assume that if you are a woman um, and you might have potential risk for diabetes in your family, a little bit of dark chocolate might not be a bad idea. Again, making sure we're pairing our carbohydrates with types of protein um, to kind of cushion the effects of our, um, our blood sugar. And uh, finally, turmeric and ginger. I have questions about this all the time. So turmeric was historically used as a natural remedy for cough, swelling, gastrointestinal distress, and skin disorders. It is well studied. It's very effective in instances of acute illness and chronic illness. It is um, absorbed. The absorption is enhanced with black pepper. Um, that's why a lot of supplements are now including a hint of black pepper in their turmeric. Don't ask me why. It's, it's science. Um, curcumin has the potential to block the activation of the TNF factor we mentioned before, tumor necrosis factor, as a potential anti-inflammatory factor. And ginger also used traditionally as a natural medicine to alleviate health problems, predominantly gastrointestinal type um, symptoms. Found effective in uh, relieving digestive ailments, can reduce nausea, vomiting, uh, GI distress, and intestinal inflammation. Reduction in markers for oxidative stress are related to colorectal cancer as well. So we have both of these in the store. Um, you can, there's fresh turmeric, there's um, turmeric in pill form, um, there's the spice, uh, the pill form is typically just the spice, so just making curry a couple times would be great. Um, ginger you can get, or turmeric you can also get in tea form, so um, having a tea that has um, one of these in it, um, that way you know it's like FDA regulated, a lot of the supplements on the shelves are not actually regulated. Um, they have to be USP certified. So I always recommend a food first approach. Um, and ginger, we have fresh available. Um, some stores I believe also offer like the um, pre-prepared, we have the pre-prepared one that's like pre-cut. Um, there's also ginger paste, which is very easy to use. Um, and there's also ginger that's like made into cubes that you can freeze and you can kind of just throw into any recipe. Lots of different options to kind of add that in. Any questions about that last slide? Okay, so this is more information about the ShopRite Dietitian Program. Um, it's one of the only programs of its kind. We are actually totally free, no insurance needed. 
um, unlimited counseling with a registered dietitian. So there are like 12 or 13 of us um, in different locations all around North Jersey. We provide the one-on-one -on -one nutrition counseling. So we're one of the only um, professionals that can provide you with medical nutrition therapy. Um, it is uh, specific to your particular ailments. If you have lab work, we can help you review it. We can help you uh, make dietary choices that can help improve your lab work potentially. We also do corporate wellness uh, classes and cooking demonstrations customized. And we are at health fairs, college resource fairs, farmer's markets, mozzarella festivals, you know, whatever I can get away with. Um, and at schools, senior centers, helping our communities kind of help uh, lead healthier lifestyles and think about, um, you know, what else they might be able to um, incorporate into their lifestyle. Any questions about any of the materials presented today or anything about the program? We had a bunch of questions in the chat. Oh, good. Very far away from the microphone, so I'm going to ask you to repeat those questions. Okay. Got it. Um, the first question Is all palm oil to be avoided limited or just the red palm oil? All palm. So, not totally avoided, but consider like if you're somebody that has cardiovascular risk, if you just got your lipid panel back and your cholesterol is really high, that's something that I would consider to look at on a food label. You know, if you pick up a food product and it has like eight grams or nine grams of saturated fat, consider that might be like half of the saturated fat for the day. So putting into perspective, you know, if you see a food product, it has palm oil, but there's only two grams of saturated fat. I'm not worried about it if it's not if you're not going to eat the whole box. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, um, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, repeat the question. Um, is all palm oil bad, right? So considering the amount, considering how much we're actually going to eat and um, what's on the label as far as the total amount of saturated fat. Um, the next question from the chat um, is, sorry, is the plant-based dairy okay, such as almond milk, coconut milk, Okay, is plant-based dairy okay? So something to consider with plant-based dairy. So I want, when I make a recommendation, I want it to have similar nutrition, depending on what we're doing. If we're losing weight, if we're, um, if we're trying to include more protein, I like to recommend plant-based milks that have kind of uh, comparable protein to cow's milk. So our soy milk and our pea milk, those are gonna be the highest in protein when it comes to plant milks. Um, I also look for, um, if somebody is a vegetarian or a vegan, I look for ones that are fortified with B12 um, and calcium, uh, similar to what cow's milk would have. Um, and in addition, I like to look for either original or unsweetened and similar carbohydrate to that of milk, depending on what the goal is. Um, typical milk has 12 grams of carbohydrate. So anything 12 or less, I'm usually fine with. Um, but typically our soy milk is uh, one of the better choices for plant milk. A lot of them can be very high in sugar. A lot of them can have no nutrition at all. Um, the next question, when it comes to food sodium, is it sea salt better, the same, or worse than regular sea salt? Okay, when it comes to sodium, is sea salt better, the same, or worse? Salt is salt. Himalayan salt is salt. I don't care what color it is, it's salt. Um, the only salt that could potentially have some effect in reducing the overall sodium you're consuming is monosodium glutamate. Don't be afraid of it. Uh, it's actually a myth, everything that you've heard about monosodium glutamate. You have glutamate in your brain. Um, you can reduce your overall sodium intake by switching to MSG. So accent is actually MSG. A lot of people are surprised to hear that. Um, but typically all salt, whether pink, sea salt, um, they have a similar amount of sodium per quarter teaspoon. I believe it's about 550 milligrams. Um, and I think the MSG is only a fraction of that because it's an amino acid with a sodium molecule. It's not just pure salt. And the final question that I currently have in the chat, um, is kombucha can be high in added sugar. Mm -hmm. What brands do you recommend? How many grams would 
be out for the night for a survey. So as with any type of like, I would say like alternative beverages when it comes to kombucha and how much sugar we're looking for, um, typically I recommend less than 15 grams um, considering how much we're drinking throughout the day. Um, if someone is drinking three kombuchas or four kombuchas, it might be a little bit too much. It might be too much overall sugar. If we're including kombucha for its functional benefit, just a little bit in the morning or you know between meals, totally fine. Um, we always wanna consider how much, uh, but typically I recommend 15 or less for our soda alternatives. Um, we also have in our store Olipop, which is another kind of functional beverage, which has nine grams of fiber, 35 calories. That's something I'd kind of be okay with a few cans a day or a couple cans a day, um, as opposed to, you know, this one might have a lot more sugar. Um, the next question is that, uh, are canola oil and sunflower oil good to add to your diet? Are canola oil and sunflower oil good to add to your diet? Yes, in combination with olive oil, avocado oils. Um, we don't want it to be the only oil. It is a healthy oil, um, but if we want the full benefit of omega-3s, we can have you know, predominantly monounsaturated fats from our olive oil, from our corn oils and our um, sunflower oils that are polyunsaturated. They are still healthy fats. Healthy fats are liquid at room temperature. Um, but again, we wanna consider how we're cooking with them. We're frying with them. We're getting a lot of fat absorbed from them. Um, but if we're just, you know, roasting, not using so much, not an issue. Anyone else? Any questions about the programs? Yes. Question about MSG actually having more sodium. What's going on in the negative publicity of MSG in the first place? I would love to talk about that. So um, there is this phenomenon uh, called Chinese restaurant syndrome, where there was this myth that was being spread about people getting sick after consuming MSG. So to put it simply, MSG is in everything. It's in our Doritos, it's in our processed foods, it's in our snack foods, it's in our pizza, it's everywhere. Um, so if you're not getting sick from those things, you're likely not getting sick from Chinese food. It's really the amount of overall sodium in a typical um, Chinese American meal in addition with the amount of carbohydrates that we're having. It can kind of overwhelm the body. It can cause dehydration if we're not drinking enough water with that. So if we might have a headache the next day, it's probably just dehydration from overall salt consumption, not just typically MSG. So MSG would be done as you said, to enhance flavor. Yes, it's a flavor enhancer because it is um, attached to that amino acid glutamate. So we have that in our body. It's a natural amino acid that we have in us. Yes. So we have um, Hackensack, New Milford, Jersey City, Hoboken. Northvale is currently hiring a dietitian. Um, we're we're all over. I can provide the full list um, through email, or you can go to dietitians at uh, dietitians.shoprite.com to make an appointment. Um, and then you can find the ShopRite that has a dietitian closest to you, um, or you can reach out to me and I can just put you in touch with whoever's closest, whatever you prefer. If you prefer the more personal approach. <laughs> right, thank you so much for having me. I have um, goodies for everyone. Um, I have um, options for tasting. So I have um, kombuchas. I have um, gelatin probiotic to taste. Um, I also have um, brown rice pasta samples to take with you to try if you haven't had it. Um, and the cutest little airline bottles of olive oil from the Cola Vita factory. So, brown cheese. <laughs> My contact is here if you want to take a picture of it. Um, I have the slides I've sent to Chelsea if you'd like to kind of have them, we'll go over them. Um, and you can always reach me at this number. Um, and this is how to get in touch with the um, Shopper Dietitian. And that's my email as well. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.